right, welcome to uh, a panel. Uh, this is called Masters of Style. And we have assembled four uh, of, of the great unique stylists in comics. Uh, my name is Gary Groth. I'm the publisher at Fanographics Books, and I'd like to introduce our panelists. Jim Woodring began his professional career in animation, working for Ruby Spears in 1979. In 1986, Fanographics began publishing the eponymously titled Jim Magazine, filled with his stories and comics and illustrations. Jim created his archetypal cartoon character, Frank, in 1972. I hope that's right, Jim. No, the it was about, about 1989, but that's... 1989, thank you. Long enough ago, it doesn't matter. Uh, Frank has been the protagonist of numerous short stories and graphic novels. Jim's latest book is, and now, sir, is this your missing gonad? <laughs> Gilbert Hernandez co-created Love and Rockets, one of the pillars of what we proudly called alternative comics in 1982. He has since gone on to create an enormous body of work, including but not limited to his acclaimed Palomar series. His most recent comic series in which he takes great glee is Blubber, and his latest graphic novel is Maria M. Mary Fleener began drawing comics mostly of an autobiographical nature in the early 1980s, contributed to the anthology Women's Comics, and published two solo comics in the early 90s, Slutburger and Fleener. Many of these stories were collected in Life of the Party in 1976. Her latest book is Billy the Bee, and she's currently working on her first graphic novel, which will, in fact, be a graphic autobiography. All right. Roman Muradov. Roman, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, yeah. Is an <laughs> author and illustrator. <laughs> uh, Roman is an author and illustrator and a book designer whose drawings have also appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Paris Review, and other magazines. His latest graphic novel is Vanishing Act. Uh, so this panel is about style. Uh, and, and the reason you're all here is because you, you, you represent uh, unique stylists in comics uh, for which your style is an important component of your work. So I think I wanted to ask you, I, I think the first question I wanted to ask you is a question of free will versus determinism. And that is, uh, did you choose your style or do you think your, child, your style chose you? if you know what I mean by that. Um, I don't know my how to go. My, my style chose me because I, it's just a, it's, it's a buffet. You know, I don't have any particular style because I don't have, I don't have natural drawing skills. Everything is labored for me. I have to work, figure it out how I'm gonna draw since, since I was a kid. I'm as the one that can just do it in his sleep, you know, but I have to work at it, which, you know, number two tries harder. <laughs> hey, you say you don't have a, you, did you say you have no style I mean, is that not no particular style. i mean people know my work because it's been 35 years they know it that way but if if you go back to the beginning you'll just see everybody i mean i remember when we we first met you mentioned a lot of ditko and you know a lot of 60s artists and this and that and i didn't even think about it because well yeah what, where else would i draw draw from you know i mean it was from comic books i read most mostly you know uh, as far as drawing goes but um, like I say, if I wanted to draw a smiling face of a funny person, I'd think of Ditko. If I wanted to do a, a sequence uh, of say nine panels on a grid and, and, and it just went you know, from one, one shot to the next, I would think of Kurtzman. It wasn't studied, but it did come to my mind. You know, I would think, well, Kurtzman would time it this way. And then uh, say Ditko would make a old person smiling this way or, you know, I never, I copied it. I mean, it never looks like, it doesn't look like their art, but that's what I'm thinking of. And that's what helped me uh, just develop a storytelling way uh, as far as the characters go. Okay. Uh, it's interesting you say that. I want to get back to that. And I want to get back to influences. Um, let me, um, who would like to, uh, Mary, would you like to? Sure. Well, I'm glad Gilbert brought that up because right now, I am struggling so hard drawing people. It is not a natural thing for me. I have to go back to what I learned in life drawing, draw the skeleton, you know, the spine, and and then, you know, go from there. It's um, it, it's very difficult, but my style, I, I chose that style of mine because I'd always drawn when I was a kid, but I didn't like what it looked like. There's just, there's just something missing. 
So when I finally saw the back cover of, it might've been Weirdo, it was a Bob Armstrong cartoon about Mickey Rat. And he's at a theater watching a colorful blue movie. And on the, on the screen, he drew the characters in sort of a, I hate to use the word, Picasso-ish way. And that's when I went, bingo. Okay, this I could have fun with. So that's sort of what influenced me was Bob, but it's hard. <laughs> and and you and you think you chose that? I mean, you chose to draw the way you draw. I oh, I deliberately swiped from that. You bet, <laughs> because you know before that everybody was it, 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 here in Southern California. It was Rick Griffin and Robert Crumb. It was just ubiquitous. You you couldn't get away from it. Everybody text you know all their doodles in high school were either you know Zap or or Murph the Surf. The Surf. So, it was hard to break away from that and all that, you know, shading and everything. So when I found, I got inspired by Armstrong's thing, I went, oh, now I get it because you can get away with murder in comics. I mean, you don't have to draw everything perfectly. And I'm learning that right now. And I just have yeah. to accept what I've drawn and, you know, warts and all, but drawing people and drawing clothes is really hard. That's something Jaime is really good at drawing clothes. I asked him once if he sew, if he sewed clothes. Because he, he gets the darts and the, the and the you know the, the armholes and everything perfectly, and I'm a sewer, so I I notice that stuff. Huh. He's yeah. he's born with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jim. <laughs> well, I can uh, I'll say for myself some of the things that Gilbert said. I've always been a, except probably it's worse in my case, I've always been a terrible draftsman. It's really, really hard for me to put a drawing together and make it look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I remember reading Harvey Kurtzman saying that every time he drew a hand, even in middle age, you had to look at his hand and see how it was constructed. And I have to do that too. I can't re remember. <laughs> it makes me wish I'd gone to school when I was younger and drilled all this stuff so it was second nature. But I'm always playing catch up. And in a way that makes it interesting because it's always a challenge. And it's always a struggle, and the struggle keeps your edge keen. So, okay, but but formal formal drawing skills is not the same as style, correct? No, no. And as far as the question of whether it chose me or I chose it, before I started drawing those Frank comics, I came up with a few different styles, which were cobbled together, uh, essentially from the three influences that I uh, sent for my three pictures, Mort Drucker, George Harriman, and Harrison Cady. They, I took special note of their drawings because they communicated in this clean, strong, virtuosic way. And they all did different things, but they just shown, they had this ability to make the, the content kind of shine through them, you know, with various kinds of mastery. And I tried, I spent, a decade at least trying to find a way to create something that would do that. That would encapsulate those things and just have that magic. You know, as a young cartoonist trying to draw, when you do anything, you get an ear that looks like Jack Davis inked it. I mean, it works in that way. It's a huge moment in your life. It's like, I did it. I captured a bottle cap full of that magic. This is, what, what's the date, you know? And uh, yearning for it to be something you could turn on and off, you know, to, to some extent. And just working with blind faith towards that. It was, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a glorious thing to go through. But the Frank thing, like every other aspect of that, that style just suggested itself to me whole. And I just did as I was told. The Roman? Um... I would say it's twofold for me. On one hand, I'm a pretty staunch disbeliever in free will. I think we just as human beings make no decisions at all. Everything is just chaos. Um, so, but I, I think I have, I think I make decisions, but that's, you know, my brain trying to trick myself into thinking that I'm alive. <laughs> um, so, and I mean, that's why every single book I've done is, I try to make it in a different style, but of course I can't because I have too much of a, <clears throat> I don't know, handwriting or whatever. So what I would do is I would just write out the name of people I want to plagiarize, but I'm really bad at it, um, thankfully. And so I do it badly. And then it turns out like what I do. Um, very often, like if I sketch pages, like instead of drawing a tree, I would just write like Jean Arp or whatever. And then um, <laughs> it means like, 
just draw <laughs> like that guy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, but also uh, um, kind of early on um, when I was in my 20s, it was definitely like a desire to exhaust as many things as I can. Um, nowadays, I definitely see myself kind of narrowing down a bit more. And, and it's also like really intuitive, but also a matter of uh, kind of general approach, which is closer to writing than to drawing. I'm much more natural with writing and I only started drawing in my mid twenties. And so like, um, you wouldn't just describe the chair six times in the exact same way, right? But then you would see a comic book and there are six panels with a chair and it's just the same chair. And that always drives me crazy. Like I, I don't understand how people do that. Uh, for me, like it has to be a different chair every single time because your perception changes from beat to beat. But also like when I explained that, I think a lot of people who are, um, who came into comics from cartooning kind of think I'm a little crazy. Um, but I think it's my, I haven't seen comics until my mid twenties, like at all. So I came into it pretty late with a lot of different conceptions. Hmm. Well, you know, you, go ahead, go ahead, Gilbert. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've had people who were aspiring cartoonists, and I don't mean young people, I mean people, you know, my age, and they wanted to make comics. They, they said they never pursued it because they couldn't draw the characters look the same. You know, they couldn't see the same, uh, you know, they would draw a character here and then it looked completely different. And for some reason, I think just reading too many comic books, I, uh, I'm able to do that. That was something I could do right away. I could draw the character look the same. I mean, sometimes I have to remind myself, oh, he's wearing this hat, not that hat, or he's got six fingers, not seven, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, you know. But uh, but if you look at old Jack Kirby comics, he did them so fast. And if it was, the continuity was that uh, he would draw an alien introduced in a comic and then in the next uh, couple of issues, he lost all this detail and his ears might be different. You know, but it, it was still the same alien creature that he was drawing. But uh, I think he would just drew so fast, I think, because he, he would forget. Because he rarely inked his own stuff. And that's when you find mistakes when you're inking. Hmm. You, know, you find, oh, he didn't, his hand is wrong, or this boot, I did, he wasn't wearing these boots. Anyway, uh, so drawing the same character all the time is easy, but uh, using the imaginary camera to t make the scene not boring, meaning he's got to talk this way, he's going to talk this way, He's got to talk that way. He can't face out the out, out the pages because that's the rule. Don't have your characters face out the pages. I ignore that, but uh -huh. they say don't do all, all those things. He, it's 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 you have an imaginary camera that you, if if it's especially if it's dialogue, you have to have the same setting, same pictures and uh, door jams, all that stuff, and that part's hard because I forget. I go, you know, I look at it and I'm drawing. I go, this is really boring to me, but hopefully the reader's not paying attention to that. They're looking at. They, they absorb the background, but they're not studying it, unless they're artists, I guess. Uh, they're, they're looking more for the expressions and the way the characters, a body's languages toward one another and the dialogue. That's why I hope, anyway. You know, Ro Roman, um, you're something, you seem like something of a stylistic chameleon. Um, vanishing act, it seems to me like all the chapters are done in a, in a, in a different style. But then I started thinking that it was basically all a variation of a theme, and the yeah. theme was the same style. Would you agree yeah, with yeah. that? I mean, like, you know, I really looked up to Tim Hensley when I was learning, um, but I'm not like him at all. Um, no. It's more like an aspiration, but like, I think I have too much of a thing that I can't beat out of myself, uh, which is this certain elegance. Um, and I, you know, like I, my influences are pretty loud and punk and not at all as pretty as what I end up drawing. But it's kind of like a, I don't know, a difficult process. But yeah, it's a lot of times also it's coming from traditions of French constrained writing like Ulipo. So a lot of the stuff that I do is just coming up with constraints like saying, um, you know, this chapter will only be done in, with this brush, which has 50% opacity, so you can't do it twice, you know, or this one, no one will have a face or whatever. Um, and I still do it, but I think like Vanishing Act, I, I drew it like quite a long time ago, just took a while for it to be translated, so I'm pretty distant from it. And I think there is kind of an annoying 
uh, aspect to it that I was like, trying a little too hard. Um, and I think, well, this book just came out in French. This is my real latest book called Adventures of Munich and Marcel Duchamp. And this one, like you can see, it's, um, it's much more consistent in style, um, but still like it, it goes through all this kind of permutation that my stuff does go through. So, hmm. uh, and, and I think like, um, yeah, for me, stylistically, a big part of it is um, kind of keeping all the mistakes. So uh, see, there's a cross here. That means I didn't like it, but then I just keep it in. And um, it was kind of a decision not to be such a big editor and try to combine so many things, but just to let the reader see how this thing is made. Right, right. Um, so back to, back to the question of whether, you know, you, style chose you or you chose style. Um, I mean, it seems to me what most of you are saying, um, romance ambivalence between free will and determinism notwithstanding, uh, you chose the style you 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 needed to to choose based on your own inner necessity. Is that would that be an accurate way of saying it? Well, as soon as I had anything that I thought looked halfway decent, I ran with it because that was such a huge breakthrough. So I didn't I didn't tr go beyond that. As soon as I had something I could make work, that was good enough. But is that because you couldn't do anything else? I mean, you couldn't do otherwise? Because even that was a hard won victory. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life trying to do something. I wanted to work with something. And once I had a tool that functioned, I just started using it. Interesting. I, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I hadn't, I, I'd heard of the spirit, right? The, the, the comic. And it wasn't until the Harvey, uh, Harvey publishers uh, did the reprints of, uh, of the spirit and they, they, they're a comics code. So there was no Ebony stories. I didn't know Ebony existed. Now that I know Ebony exists, I'm, it's a little problematic, but um, I remember being so enamored with it thinking like, this is how I have to learn to do comics. This is the mid sixties. So I'm still a kid. And over the years, I always go, I'm going to do something like the spirit. So I, I just did a ripoff called twilight and it was the same thing in this. And I did like half a page and it was the sh worst thing. I mean, I, I was already a teenager. I could already draw okay, just just okay. But I just remember thinking like, well, it's not me. That's why. Because uh, uh, there's a lot of artists who will go after a certain artist and just go for it. They'll keep working until they get to where they want to with that artist. And, and you see that a lot with the mainstream artists. Mainstream artists are more interested in the drawing and the line of putting it down, make it look like the coolest comic they can. Whereas the indie artists are more about telling their story and the observation of the world, you know which is more important to me. That's why I'm not a mainstream guy. Uh, but um, And style is, is integral to that. Yeah, it's that just, it's, it's your personality really. In, in a way, your personality doing the drawing, you know. And, and, and it's also a lot of shortcuts in comics, which is great, which Mary mentioned earlier, is because you don't have to represent. You don't have to, this is what, you know, pe uh, Polynesian people look like. Well, you can cartoon them, you know, uh, with respect, you know you can uh, tweak things you can, and for me i like i draw in different styles because a, 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 a pseudo realistic style won't work for a certain story that's what blubber's about where it's i stylize it in a certain way where it'll, it'll work you know but if i want to do something that connects to people i'll try to be fairly realistic fairly as much as i can that really that people will you know feel connected to that's how it that i'm Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Oh, I was gonna say that's kind of what I'm doing with my book right now. I'm trying to do, you know, people that look like people, but then, as you know, I like to do uh, freak out scenes where you get take the geometric thing to any place you want to take it. But the reason I like that is I never know what's going to happen. Hmm. So I want to, you know, have fun while I'm drawing, but I also want to be surprised and have happy accidents, and that's really neat. But another thing I'm trying to do is what Roman's doing is getting really loose. So instead of drawing a real tight face with the, the jawline, you know, clearly defined in eyes, I'm trying to do brush brushy stuff now where I'm using multiple lines for one line to make it, to, to create another sense of, of, of tension instead of the cubistic stuff I've been doing. 
and I like this sort of, uh, like he said, he left the mistakes in there. And I'm, I'm trying that out too. And it's really become very interesting to me. Well, now, Mary, you've always drawn people. I mean, life of the party was full of people. You, you yes, but, well, I wasn't using a brush then. And so to get a thick line, I would have to take the technical pen and make two parallel lines and then fill it in. And that made a very, I, once there I did, uh, it, it, the lines were so thick and heavy. It was almost, it was just, it was just too much. And then when I started using the, the brush, uh, that's, that's, I still use the pens, don't get me wrong, but the brush allows more of a, um, a feeling that you see in Torpedo. I love those comics uh, the, 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 about the gangster guy. I'm really influenced by that loose brush style. And then you can see sometimes he runs out of ink, but he doesn't stop anyway. So the line kind of fades, and that's, I think that's really neat. Mm -hmm. Who's that artist that does that? Bird? Uh, uh, what is the name? Yeah. Yeah, there's two guys, and the first guy, Alex Toth, uh, he dropped out after a couple issues. But mm -hmm. I, that's uh, another big influence, which you wouldn't think would go with the tight, out, the, tight, <laughs> the tight geometric style I do. But I like the juxtaposition. I'm trying to get looser all the time. It's hard. It is hard. I try to draw loose and I can't stand the results. I just, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I just don't have the neck. Some people can, some people can't, you know. I just Jim, did, you not draw, Sorry. did you not draw looser uh, earlier in the 80s and early 90s? I mean, your autobiographical stories? Well, I had a kind of contrived looseness to hide my lack of skill. You know, it looked like I was... I tried to make it look like I could draw so fast that it was a little careless, but it was extremely painstakingly calculated and I had to do it over and over again because I got the parabolas wrong and they created the wrong energy and I had to just keep redoing them. I drew on drafting villain for a long time because I, I could erase a whole panel with ammonia and then rework on the same page and it was, I had to do a lot of that stuff. So I wish I could, you know, I was looking at Pat Oliphant's drawings yesterday and thinking, God almighty, I wish I could do this, draw a crowd scene with every face approached from an entirely different stylistic direction and making up whole new volumes and vocabularies. Every time you draw something, I so wish I could do that. But, you know, there's not very many people who can, so I can't really complain. Right, right. Um, it, do, do you think that style and content are indivisible? In other words, is style content? Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Maybe not in all work. Maybe there are some things where it wouldn't matter who drew it, but I think in our in the ca our cases, it's true. Okay. So does that mean that the kind of content you were predisposed to do uh, essentially help create the style that you that you eventually developed. Yeah, that and also natural limitations. Um, for, in my case, making the most of it. In my case, uh, I did choose a style for Palomar because I didn't want it to, because I wanted to tell heartfelt stories that you know communicated with people. So, I settled on a, a sort of a with my limits, a, a sort of a semi Bigfoot style, you know, because in, in the past when I was reading comics that I really liked, they, they, they almost had a Bigfoot style. You like, uh, I, I want to bring up, this is a bad example, like say somebody like Dan DiCarlo, you know, who is very good at body language and all that stuff. But if you really look at it, uh, it's a streamlined Bigfoot style. It's not realistic, but you see people there. There are people in these panels. Um, uh, so for me, I, I chose uh, my in my limits uh, a Palomar to look like it's the world, even though it's very stylized in in, in its in its way, you know, in my my drawings way. Uh, so it was conscious to tell that story with that art. If I had drawn it like uh, say, if I just aped Peter Bag or something, it just wouldn't have worked for me, you know. Uh, you know, just this wacky line work and stuff. That even though Peter's done written some serious stuff, sometimes his art. Uh, bumps against it a little bit. You mean when he like his biographical? Yeah, he'll he'll write something serious and good, really good. But his his crazy art will just sometimes be a little uh, distracting, a little bit. I'm yeah, not putting them down. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he really pulled it off though with fire. That book about Zora Neale Hurston, because mm. I was wondering if he was going to do the neat stuff, hate yeah. you know exaggerations for that. And it was you could tell it was Peter Bag, 
but it was straight, you know, it was straight along with the story. And he, it's very good, very good book. He well, that's a great down. example of, of someone's, I don't know, someone whose style you recognize as being um, appropriate to one kind of story, applying it to an entirely different kind oh. of story. Um, and I guess that was, I guess that was my question, you know, does, I mean, does style, uh, does content follow style or, 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 or vice versa? Do you develop the, uh, do, you, do, do you develop the style you have because of the kinds of stories you innately want to tell? Well, Jack Davis did things that were as zany as they got and pretty straight too. And they weren't drawn the same way, but they were stylistically linked, you know, you can see oh, that yeah. they were on the same spectrum. I don't know how many people can do that. Yeah, Wally Wood could do that. Um, yeah, he could do that. Not too many, but yeah, but it, that, that's right, that's right. I mean, in a way you, I mean, in a way you all have some, um, I mean, you all have variation. Uh, I mean, you do, uh, I mean, your, your autobiographical stuff, which, you know, which you no longer really do, and which I miss terribly, <laughs> is, is different than Frank, but, but they are linked. I mean, well, you know, I don't see that they're linked, actually. I, I see them as well, being... I, I questioned that the moment I said it, but yeah. Coming from entirely different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you... Okay, so that's a good question. So how did you move from, from the earlier work you did to developing the kind of stylistic iconography of Frank? Because you created that... You created a very distinctive yeah. world. You know how it happened? I don't know. It just... Uh, an opportunity appeared for me to do something and that popped into my head. The first story popped into my head, the style popped into my head, I drew it. And after that, it's just been a matter of making sure I know what the marching orders are and then doing it. It really doesn't feel like it's something I created. It's, some, it's the corniest thing in the world to say, but I really do feel, I mean, when I write those things down, I'm not thinking, oh, here's a plot, it's gotta go here, it's gotta go there. They just, I just write down the ideas as they come to me which is unusual. It's a unique thing in my life. Yeah, yeah. But it also comes, I mean, as, it, as I've looked at the arc of those stories, I see that it has been really significant to me personally, telling me things about myself and my life in a way that I didn't have any idea was happening when I was doing them. So for me, the whole thing is kind of a phenomenon. I don't think of it as so much as my work as something that happened to me. Those autobiographical stories are my work, but Frank is just something that I got to do. And See, that's the way I felt about Billy the Bee. It just was, it just came out of me. It was so easy. Yeah. And I let my mind open like you're talking about. And now that I'm doing autobiographical, everything's got to be factual and I got to get the timeline right, the date. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, harder. Yeah, I was surprised I, that stream of consciousness name had never happened to me before. It's quite an experience, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, working to objective standards is difficult. And Gilbert, you can move from uh, from a Palomar story to Blubber, um, yeah. <laughs> which I think are stylistically linked, but still they're radically. I don't know. Do, do they do they do they require uh, different parts of your brain or? Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, if you'll notice through uh, Palomar, especially toward the end, uh, I got so, uh, it was so hyper violent and, and surreal toward the end that I knew that it was coming to an end. I couldn't maintain uh, doing new Palomar stories without coming up with crazy stuff. So yeah, because I'd done the, uh, the characterization, the characters, how they deal with each other and this and that for so long that after a while I, I ran out for those characters. It's hard to do old new stories for old characters. So I just ended up, uh, you know, just kind of like backing out Palomar. I knew I'd be criticized for doing things other than that weren't like Palomar. You know, a lot of uh, reviews I've gotten for books, uh, for stuff I've, I, that I was happy with, a lot of the reviewers going like, this doesn't have the same connections as Palomar. And I, and I go, well, it's not supposed to. I go, well, then, then it's not. As good. So that's where you end up like, okay, so. For what I ended Palomar in like the mid '90s, and then here we are in 2020, wow. you know, and I'm, and I'm still uh, 
and I'm still doing different stuff. So, at, at, so when it gets to that point, it just means that there's a new generation, younger generation of people interested in different kinds of comics. We, I, we don't have to worry about that. We have to uh, worry about keeping our head above water, but other, uh, artistically, we don't have to worry about it. We have to be ourselves, no matter right. what. We cannot, I think I'll make up a kind of Spider-Man character at this point in my yeah, career. You know, it's, <laughs> it just means nothing. So basically I'm just being goofy, really. I mean, and just using what I, my imagine, because that's, that's my greatest strength after Palomar is, is my imagination. I just make up stuff and then draw it, you know, but I keep it limited to my drawing skills, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but you draw it in your own unique way. And if that same imagination was applied by a different artist drawing it in a different way, it would be an entirely different work. I don't, I don't know. I just, I just do it as I, I wake up in the morning and I decide what I'm going to do. That's all. <laughs> right, right, right. But I guess, I guess I'm trying to say that the style is also what makes it uniquely yours. I mean, I, you know, if you can separate your imagination from the mm -hmm. style in which you mm -hmm. draw it, which I, I'm not sure you can. I guess. Well, I would say you can't because, you know, Gilbert's work is a good example. It's got a Gilbert, a static Gilbert drawing is imbued with character that is uniquely his. It's just got, even if there's no, nothing else there but the drawing, it's got substance of a sort. And that's right. the magic that is so elusive that uh, all the young cartoonists I knew growing up were desperate to find a way to achieve that. Where things just looked like they belonged there and they were done by somebody who knew what they were doing. And not everybody can do that. So if, if style is imbued with character, uh, is there good style and bad style? I mean, can you look at something and say, this is a terrible? Well, I don't think everybody's style is imbued with character. I think that the work of the best artists are, I, th I th think some people's work is, you know, very generic and it kind of doesn't matter who do it. But now that I think about it, the work of everybody I love has that, that essence, that whatever it is, you know, that makes you think this, this, this deserves to live. This is good. This is done by somebody who knows what they're doing and has something to say. And they've been, they're an anointed artist. They should be doing this. And I don't get that very often. From... What, what, what I feel is a shame these days, and it's nobody's fault, but it's, I think it's a shame that we have to defend Prince Valiant today. You know, something uh -huh. that's obviously done like this guy was busting his ass to make the best comic strip he could think of. You know, and, and you know the art, the, the, the art, the, the detail of it, that this and that, that, and you'll show it to most young people now, and they they just like get this away from me. This is school, you know. I don't, I don't want to look at this. Or I think it's just that intimidation of like, oh, if I'm going to draw, <laughs> I'm not going to look at that, you know. Whereas uh, the generations before started out as kids loving that and wanting to do that, and then ending up doing whatever they're going to do. But anyway. Uh, like you're saying generic, I think a lot of old artists that I admire are just considered generic now, if they looked at it. If you look at a really beautiful L. Williamson page, even if it's Flash Gordon, I see really good art there. I see good drawing, care, he loved it. And you show it to people now, it's just a blank stare. It's like, well, you know, it means, it means nothing, you know? Oh. So um, anyway, I just think it's a shame that really good drawing is only in mainstream now. I mean, really, really people that really are dedicated and crazy about drawing well. Uh, it's not someone really. Someone really like Bloch, though. I'm sorry. Someone like Bloch. Bloch, the French cartoonist. Right. Who can who draws really really well. Yeah, well, and see, he's that's, also that's, a good that's... example of someone who really shifts styles, but he's just he's the closest thing I think we have to master. But but all of his work is recognizable. Who? Yeah, but he goes like from funny animals to extremely realistic paintings, and it's like the level of skill there is insane but also it's not like just showing off it's very thought through style wise but he's an exception i would say yeah right 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 but you know you but you can tell by the, the brush stroke no matter what he draws you know what the content is that it's still mm -hmm. him yeah uh, there's a handwriting to it yeah yeah um Do you, do you think that style, uh, developing a style and owning that style is an act of self-definition? That you are defining yourself by your style? That you're sort of living and dying by your style? 
Um, I feel that about my comics, but not necessarily just the style. I mean, everything about them, you know, even if, you know, I mean. Content and style are, are one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's just, it, well, it's basically my personality and I'm able to draw it on the paper. That's, you know, it's my little, my little niche, you know. Um, you know, authors do that. You know, authors are put themselves yeah. into a, a novel or whatever, you know. Um, I think everybody up here is, is you, it's, it's a good group of people who are just individuals who create what they do. And it's, it's all personality. That person is doing that. Nobody's draws, nobody does comics like Mary or, or, or Jim or, you know, Roman, nobody else does that. These are all individual. You know, yeah. And it's all personality and the style comes out of, you know, who they are. I also always thought of, of developing a style as staking out territory. When I was, developing my style, there were things that I did naturally and easily and they looked good, but I stopped doing them because it looked like somebody else's work. Mm. I, when I first started drawing, I had a kind of a more, much more organic line than I ended up with. And then our crumb co-opted that so thoroughly, I thought yeah. I don't want to have anything, my, my work resemble anybody else's work in a way that is distracting. I don't mind if people see influences buried in it, but I don't want it to be, you know, the headlights. So you had to fight to be yourself. Well, I had to say, you know, I'm presenting something that's going to go into the public square. And I was thinking, how are people going to see this? Are people going to look at this and immediately say, oh, he's just, you know, I remember, uh, well, I won't, say, I won't say that, but, you know, I just wanted to make sure that what I did could stand on its own feet and its own merits as something that was at least, you know, original in some way that, I always felt that any kind of originality was was a big plus in artwork because it's not easy to come by and make it work. It's easy to be original, but it's not easy to be original in a way that's palatable. And it's I always thought that was a major aspect of it. How do you all deal with incorporating influences, um, uh, but yet retaining your own unique style. In other I mean, I, 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 Gilbert and I, you know, have talked about this before, but there's a little bit of Ditko and Gilbert and a little bit of DiCarlo. And I mean, there's various people, but that, but he is still uniquely his own. His so own everybody life. does that, don't they? I mean, you learn from looking at other people's work, you, you have to incorporate it. So how, yeah. how do you, oh, I think there comes a point where you really, you have to accept your influence and, and little cliches and things that you'll never be able to kick uh like once again robert crumb when i started cartooning i was just so influenced by him that i didn't want to have anything to do with that cross hatching or shading so i was drawing with a sharpie pen just <laughs> to do the most crude tool i could use to try to do something new because you know elvis presley's manager uh, colonel tom parker said the most important thing in show business or entertainment or anything is to be original that's really just the most important thing to do. So it was really a rude awakening for me. It was like 2012, I was doing political cartoons for a little local paper here in Encinitas. And my editor goes, hey, somebody today asked me, how'd you get Robert Crumb? And I felt <laughs> like I failed. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, I've been trying like 30 years not to draw like him and now I'm getting compared. And I thought, okay, you know what? There's just some things like, and like playing music. I'm learning drums right now. I'm always going to want to play like Keith Moon, where you just go -a 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 -a, like that. I'll never be able to get there, but it's the same thing. You just have to try to be original and try to evolve with your style and keep changing and, and, and growing. It's funny because there was a period in the late 80s and the 90s where people would confuse my art with Dan Klaus's. <laughs> they would uh, see a drawing I did. They go, I thought this was Dan Klaus. Did you copy it from him? You know, slowly I turn step oh, by step. Wow. Yeah. You know, uh, no, I, you know, I love Dan and I love his work, but uh, it was like, I, I couldn't see it. It's just that we like the same kind of 1950s monster comics. You know, we, we like those things. You know, he loves EC comics and all the knockoffs and so do I. So we kind of just brought that with us, you know, as we you know made comics and. Uh, I, I, I can see an occasional affinity. I mean, Dan was influenced by Ditko as well. So I, yeah. I, can, I can see a kind of affinity, a stylistic affinity. It's just that the, 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 I didn't realize, because see, when I think about us, I, I look at everybody, we, we all read certain comics, we're all influenced by them, we really like them, uh, the, the certain art styles, and we forget that sometimes the readers don't have that background. 
So when they look at it, they're looking at it fresh. They're seeing how I draw, how I draw, how Dan draws, how Mary draws, how Jim, Roman. They look at that and say, oh, this, and, and, and there's always this kind of, I think, a brain response to say, well, what's this like? What else is like this? I think that pops in our, our heads. You know, so if you look at Jim's work or Mary, especially, you go, nobody, I can't, there's no frame of reference. So they look, they scramble for them, you know, for a frame of reference. Uh, you know, I, I happen to know where a lot of our influences are. So I go, oh, okay, you know, I can see the Fleischer brothers and Jim's work, you know, but a lot of people looking at Jim's work won't, won't even know that. Well, what's the Fleischer brothers? Oh, they were the better Disney. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, onward. Right. I had a, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go right ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, I remember a moment when I was trying to learn to draw in a style and I had, I had huge ambitions and I reached a point where I could do something that was way below what I wanted to do, but I could do it. And I just, I remember just sort of settling, settling for it. I just settled. I said, okay, this will work. I'll just do this. And it turned out a lot better than I thought it would have. I was just wondering, it seemed like a magic moment for me. And I was wondering if you had experienced something like that, a breakthrough moment where you just sort of succeeded by making it slightly easier on yourself, not trying to do something that was impossible. Did you ever have that happen? It was like turning a switch for me. Hmm. Oh, well. I think what helps as uh, artists once in a while is to put yourself into a character. Say, this is this artist drawing this story. The way actors do, you know, they put themselves into a character. And even if they're sort of a boring person in real life, they'll, they'll be an exciting, you know, actor, uh, character. I think that works sometimes with cartooning. Because I notice cartoonists that aren't really very good doing their own work. But if they copy somebody else, it doesn't quite look like that other person. But right. it brought something out of that artist to do something uh, bigger and, and better, you know. Right. Uh, I can't, well, let me see, I, I, I just jumped in a hole here because example. I don't think names. Uh, I, I, what I think I was trying to describe is a situation where if you're trying to do more than you can do, you can't do it. And if you're trying to do something that's easier for you, there's no interest in it. So there's mm -hmm. just a point slightly beyond what you can do comfortably where you can still do it, but it's leading you out of the past and into the future. That's a really delicate edge. And that, that's what I was trying to describe there. Mm -hmm. Except I, 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 uh, people ask me if, uh, because a lot of my backgrounds are not natural looking. Because <laughs> uh, whenever I uh, copy from a photograph or even just, you know, looking at a lamppost or stuff, it looks like I copied it. So it makes the rest of the art look crappy. You know, it does. It looks amateurish. It looks lousy. If I draw a car that looks exactly what a car looks like, uh, it just, it doesn't come out for me. Yeah. It doesn't come out. You know, right. and, and then here we go. I go back to my brother Jaime. He would draw a lamppost out of memory. See how Jaime's work, uh, his brain works, is he's already got this natural talent, but he also has a, a filter in his brain to where when he sees a lamppost, it filters through him and he brings it out on the page. And if he doesn't remember the details, he'll make up the details and it'll be accurate or close to accurate. Mm -hmm. So, what I got to do is go out there and draw a, a lamppost, but I got to kind of fake it a little bit. You know, and, and, I mean, draw it as best I can to look like a lamppost. Uh, but I can't make it exact. I can't put the exact little details in it because the rest of my artwork will look like, well, that was copied. No kidding. You know. Mm -hmm. you, do you draw the essence of a lamppost? <laughs> Barely. I mean, I mean, some <laughs> artists draw. You know, they don't draw a chair. They don't draw a car. They draw. <clears throat> you know, I don't know the 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 uh, you know they, they capture the essence of the object rather than yeah. Well, a lot of a lot of times you're, you uh, what Mary was talking about earlier. You. Uh, you'll use silhou silhouettes, <laughs> you know? I really am not gonna draw the detail of the scales that's on this, you know, giant fish. I'm gonna draw a silhouette of a fish, you know? That well, is that related to what you were saying, Roman, about um, not wanting to draw the same chair the same way each time, but approach it differently and capture its, its essence in a new way each time you draw, just to keep it interesting? Yeah, and, and you know, uh, people always write to me that my stuff looks effortless and natural, but it really isn't. Mm -hmm. And I obsess over every single thing. And, but like I very often redraw things to make them uglier, uh, just because it would make more sense emotionally for the right. story or whatever. And it's not about the pursuit of beauty or like showing off what a cool stylist you are. It's just about the getting the, the singness of the thing and the perception of the character that you're embodying. Okay. 
you know, it's a staple of comics that everything is supposed to look the same from panel to panel. I mean, you know, objects and people, I mean, unless you're Cliff Sterrett, but, um, but you're, but you sort of rebel against that. You, I mean, have you yeah, but I, well, that's the thing that people kind of see it as something experimental, but I think it's much more realistic because if you're sitting and having a conversation, you're not seeing the entire thing, you know, from one moment you're focusing on the shirt, the other moment on the tree. And I think, uh, yeah, um, my approach is kind of approximating the human experience, which is pretty chaotic to me, at least. Right, right, right. So like if you're walking through the city, why would I draw the entire city? Because you can't see that. Um, your attention shifts and, and that's how I approach drawing the same way as writing. So if you're writing about someone coming into a room and seeing a, a chair, then there must be a reason for that chair to be there. Otherwise you wouldn't mention it. So why would you draw it like in a very detailed way then? If the chair is not important, just do like four lines. Anyway, that's my hot take. That's one of the continuity is one of the most difficult things in comics. You know, if you're trying to do something with time or attention or something, you know, a little detail being off can really mess it up. Mm -hmm. But if you're a virtuoso, it doesn't matter. You can do that and people will stick with the narrative. My, my Frank comics are so static that if there's a hair out of place, it, it stands out. But I am able to control the mood as best I can. What Crazy Cat did it. Yeah, well, Crazy Cat was pure virtuosity. You know, I can't, I can't pretend to do that. I have to do my own third-rate fake version. I don't know. You got to be careful when you when you really cut loose because I had one page in a story I did where I come back from a gig and it's three in the morning and my house is full of people and they're doing all sorts of chemical substances. It's chaos. It's a it's a wild scene. And I just wanted to show what it was like to have a single per person walk into this insanity. So I drew it any way I felt like I didn't pay attention to perspective or anything. And a few years later, Jessica Abel asked me if she could use that page in her book on perspective to oh, show really? the absolute worst example of somebody who did, ignored all the rules and uh, did whatever they pleased. And I said, sure, go ahead. So I am uh, an example of somebody who doesn't know perspective very well, but you know, what the hell? I wasn't going for accuracy. I was going for shock and awe. Right. Well, that's a great thing to but be. I, but I got a, a great F. <laughs> um, Gilbert, you have a lot of characters in your stories. Do you have trouble uh, maintaining consistency? Never. I, I know exactly who each one of them is, but the problem is uh, they, they begin, with so many, they, they can repeat, you know, uh, personalities. And sometimes I need that for a particular story, but it's really it's really become a burden in the sense that uh, I have to narrow it down to certain people with the personalities I want to use. But a lot of these people aren't on the same, you know, in the same uh, place on earth, you know, some people are in the U S some people are somewhere else. Uh, so as far as originally in Palomar, I never, I never uh, got confused with characters or now I have to look back and, and research my own work to see what, if a character's dead or not. I don't even know. You know? <laughs> so, um, so that's not a problem now. So, it's, so I've kind of put a lot of the characters away, and I'm I have a, no, a whole new cast. But I got to be careful of them, uh, yeah. not repeating what the other ones did. You know, yeah, uh, I assumed you had a spreadsheet. No, I should. I should. I should have more uh, discipline with that kind of stuff. So I'll remember. But I don't think I need it anymore. I don't think anybody cares about what comics I do now. Just that I do them. You know, I don't think they're looking for, when's Gilbert going to do that comic? Or maybe there are people, I don't know, because I'm sure not that person. I'm just making it in the next comics, the next comics, because, you know, I've got, what, got 10 years left? <laughs> you know, I hate to be a grim about it, but, you know, what, 10? Well, I just spoke to Al Jaffe the other day, and he retired at 99, so yeah, right. he might have longer than He's that's just one Al Jaffe, you know, that's the thing, you know. Uh, Richard Sala just passed. He was, you know, mid sixties. So, you know, uh, you gotta get your stuff out there, but uh, always, always respect the reader. Always respect what you're doing. You know, I mean, even if it's wacky or out of what you, you, something you haven't, you know, it's not like what you did before, you know, uh, the older cartoonists tend to look to shock people just to get noticed. 
And I try to avoid that. So I try to avoid that with blubber. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just nah, your pants up higher. Yeah, I'm just you know I'm the old guy who's just trying to shock the kids. You know, I, you know. <laughs> well, it is shocking for the kids because there are no other kids don't make those comics. You yeah. know, young people don't make those kind of comics. They you know? need it. Those you shock me fairly consistently. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I, grew, I my first Zap comic was number three, you know, the Joe Blow story and stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that that is, that everything was underage, but I remember being fascinated. I go, this is this is where it's at, you know. And all my friends, you know, kids I know at school, did you see his new issue of Spider Man? I mean, no, 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 you got to look at this. Mm -hmm. But um, you can get in trouble with the uh, Zap three, let me tell you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just saw a little clip, a uh, little thing on TV of uh, Dennis Hopper talking about the. Uh, the, the director Nicholas Ray and they're just showing all these clips of Nicholas Ray looking at you know doing stuff directing stuff and there's one shot of him holding zap three and he's oh, looking right. at it intently like you know it's I, and I'm sorry I didn't record it I just it just passed by and I was like oh that's zap three I recognize that uh, Rick Griffin cover I think it's Rick Griffin no I it might be Rick Griffin cover might be Rick, yeah that might be a little late to have influenced uh, Nicholas Ray <laughs> right and and you know those directors they all look alike they look like all look like Sam Fuller like crazy professors they have their hair white hair <laughs> out, you know and they bark out their directions you know it's funny I guess I should be doing that I shouldn't comb my hair anymore <laughs> Well, I want to thank all of you for, for uh, uh, participating in the panel and uh, appreciate all of your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, nice thank to meet you, Roman. I sure like your work. Yeah, great.